Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The blessings of God be upon you all and welcome to a new lecture. It's in the series of the Strategic Studies Units Lectures, which is part of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. It's my honor today to present a lecturer, Professor John Philip Yul will be speaking to us on uh, the title From Syria to Gaza via Ukraine. The Professor Filiu is an Arabist and a historian. He works at the Sciences Po and uh, he lectures on the Arab and Middle Eastern studies. He was a visiting lecturer at New York and Columbia and a cultural advisor to the Prime Minister and Minister of Defense in France. And he was one of the 10 independent uh, advisors who contributed in 2013 to the White Book on Defense in France, which was appointed by President Hollande. He has many books on Islam and uh, from the deep state to the ISIS, and uh, finally his book, Gaza, uh, Gaza, A History. He won the Palestine Book Award. His works have been translated into more than 15 languages, including Arabic and Turkish. And for those who who reads French, he has uh, a weekly column on Le Monde who talks about uh, the war in Gaza and the Ukraine and other places in the world where, are, where there are armed conflicts. Now I'll switch to English. Go ahead and leave the floor for uh, Jean-Pierre. He will have about 30 minutes and uh, then we will move on for the questions. Without further ado, Professor Filiot, please. Shukran ya Dr. Omar. Ashkurukum jamiyan bi az al hudur. Thank you very much for your attendance. And I thank the Arab Center for this kind invitation. And because of my Arabic is not up to standard, I'll switch to English. From Syria to Gaza via Ukraine. And I think it's very important to connect the different dots between all those crises that are definitely reshaping the world we are living in. Benjamin Netanyahu has definitely three things to thank Bashar al-Assad for. First, for having preserved, apart from two incidents in 2011, the ceasefire that has prevailed since 1974 between Israel and Syria, a ceasefire that nonetheless enabled Israel to annex the Syrian territory of the Golanates. The second thing Netanyahu was to thank Bashar for is for having blindly ransacked the thousand-year-old heritage of Aleppo and the rest of Syria, setting a precedent for the ongoing ransacking of the thousand-year-old heritage of Gaza. And finally, for having bombed the suburbs of Damascus with chemical weapons with impunity in 2013, setting a precedent of impunity for such mass crimes. It is all the more revealing that Joe Biden, the present guarantor of Israeli impunity in the ongoing offensive against Gaza, was Barack Obama's vice president, who was the guarantor of the impunity of Assad in 2013 by not enforcing his so-called red lines. The counterexample of Ukraine proves, however, that campaign of denial of mass crimes 
can be defeated if the world is willing so. The key, the key to minimizing or even concealing the suffering inflicted collectively on an entire population lies in the ban on access to the field by the international media, meaning the Western media. It took the Assad dictatorship two long years, from 2011 to 2013, to effectively ban foreign journalists, meaning Western journalists, from observing the Syrian theater of war if they wish to work independently. Of course, if they were ready to accept the constant uh, company, to say the least, of the regime political police, they were welcome. Those two long years of intimidation and violence uh, reached even the level of targeted attacks, as in the case of the French journalist Rémi Oschlick, the US journalist Marie Colvin, killed in a targeted bombing on a press center in 2012 in Homs. You had other occurrences, you had journalists being abducted, journalists being killed, but that was really the policy. And this really led to the fact that when the chemical bombings happened, there was nobody there in Damascus to report on them independently, apart, and I will immediately come to that, from the so-called citizen journalist or so-called journalist. Israel, on the other hand, didn't have to expel the foreign press from the Gaza Strip, from which they were, in any case, absent during the massacres perpetrated by Hamas on October 7, 2023. All the Netanyahu government had to do was to tighten the 16-year strangled on Gaza. And since the start of the current offensive, prohibit access by the international press, except for the few visits strictly supervised by the Israeli army, despite repeated requests from correspondents based in Israel. They even uh, presented the request to the Supreme Court. So in Syria, what we had after the foreign, meaning the Western press, was banned from the Syrian territory was the so-called Syrian citizen journalist. And they believed it. And they took a lot of risk to inform the world, believing we are talking 10 years ago, and you see how historian, I'm a historian, repeats itself sometimes in the saddest way. Believing that if they were ready to sacrifice their lives in order to send to the world images, testimonies of the horrors going on on the ground, then the world would react. The world would react. Mm -hmm. I saw that in Aleppo, where I was in the summer of 2013, shortly before the gas bombing in Damascus. And when I saw, I had a friend, for example, I could speak about him, Abu Nur, Zakari Abdel Kafi, he was a citizen journalist, one of many that came out of the Tansikiyat, the local coordination committees, that were really, really the grassroots structure of the Syrian revolution. And each one of these committees had a media uh, section. Uh, and this media section was reporting to the outside world, taking risk, I think, maybe only Syrians, Palestinians, and Ukrainians in this room can imagine. And they delivered the <coughs> pictures, they delivered the videos to the world. Uh, and as we will see, the sacrifice was not enough because you have slandering campaign, systematic campaign going on against them. Uh, 
and the fact that they were taking those weeks, that they were becoming more and more professional, didn't prevent them from suffering from this campaign and didn't prevent the truth from being smeared by the Assad regime. Uh, and we will soon see how those techniques that have been uh, systematized by the Assad regime with the strong backing of the Putin regime, because all this is a big history about organized disinformation, can reflect on what we are living now in Gaza. If I talk about my friend Abu Nur, it's also because his story is very revealing, because he was trained as a press photographer, so a war photographer, going on the front line. I remember I was with him on certain times in Salahedin, in the Salahedin neighborhood in uh, Aleppo. And after I left, and of course he stayed, he was at one moment as a photographer. He lost his eye because of a sniper shot in Aleppo. And he had to be evacuated, went to Paris, we met again in Paris, and in Paris he finally got a uh, uh, an artificial eye to replace the one the Assad regime I took, had taken from him because he was a witness to the horror going on. And because he had this training, he became a, a stringer for the Agence France Presse. And uh, some of the great photos even got the World Press Award in 2017 because of an incredible picture in a riots in Paris of a burning uh, a, a human torch who happened to be a French policeman during a riot because no, no French photographer would have dared to take this picture. But for him, with his Syrian background, what was happening was tough, but he could be very close to the action and take eventually the picture. So his professionalism was beyond any doubt. But so many of the citizen journalists were killed. And today, in Gaza, we see how the coverage of the conflict relies on Palestinian journalists whose credibility is systematically called into question by Israel and its supporters around the world even though those journalists have paid a terrible price for the bombardments, for the killings uh, uh, at the end of October, so if I count still well, October, November, three months ago, I attended a media literacy UNESCO conference in Tunis that was opened by Dakik uh, Atsamt, by a uh, minute of silence, of mourning, to praise those journalists. At that time, there were 18 who had been killed already. And you know, those UN conference, uh, they have panels, um, everybody is very expert, expert, except myself, and they asked me, what are your advice on media literacy? What do you suggest for people to do in order for this kind of information to be disseminated? I say, well, my first advice is to keep those journalists alive because they are threatened to be killed. Today, it's probably more than 100 of them already killed. Uh, and you know, uh, because some of them work for uh, Qatari uh, media, for Al Jazeera, but it's not only that. You have this whole population, this whole dedicated population I just saw this morning, you know, the video of Amr Daoudi collapsing from starvation while he was reporting. So it's not only the question of people being killed, they are suffering the same suffering of the whole population and they still prevail despite what they suffer, what their family suffered, and despite that they are being smeared. You know that Reporters Without Borders has already filed two complaints against Israel on this subject before the International Criminal Court. And worse still, this journalism, K1, 
carried out in conditions of extreme insecurity is equated with Hamas quote-unquote victim communication. Even so, the Islamist militia prefers to exalt its own combat performance. So this assimilation is denying the very legitimacy of Palestinian civilians' accounts of the suffering inflicted on other Palestinian civilians, with, as you know, more than 1% of the population already killed. 1%. This, just this figure is mind-boggling. 1%. So you can deduce the number of injured, maimed, orphans. It's horrendous. But, so, first step, banning the international press. The second step is slender, slender, and more slender. The Assad regime stopped at nothing, no matter how outrageous, to tarnish the reputation of citizen journalists who risk their life to report on the tragedy of the besieged population. They were accused of being Salafi, jihadi, terrorist infiltrators. They were accused of spreading partisan propaganda. They were accused of being agents of this regime or that regime. Of course, agent of this intelligence service or that intelligence service, or even affabulators outside Syria while they were under the bombs. They were saying, oh no, he's alive and kicking very well in Antalya, Istanbul, I don't know where. What is important is that those accusations didn't need to be coherent. They wanted that the doubt would be cast on the validities of the testimonies themselves. Slender, 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 so you can cast a shadow on what is currently happening. In a similar vein, Israeli propaganda accuses burials of infants, of kids, of babies in Gaza to be staged with plastic dolls. You know, I'm 62. I thought I had heard everything. That was really something new. By contrast, Netanyahu and his government claim that the remains of 40 murdered babies by Hamas were discovered at the kibbutz of Kfar Aza, a claim relayed by nobody less than Joe Biden himself on the basis of quote unquote confirmed photograph of terrorists beheading children. The reality, because journalists are doing their job, the Agence France Presse did its job, was that 46 civilians were indeed massacred in horrible circumstances at this very kibbutz. But the youngest one was 14 year old. The terrorist carnage of October 7, 2023 was in itself sufficiently atrocious and condemnable not to need to be amplified by such manipulations. Rather, these maneuvers aim to dehumanize the Palestinians by literally removing them from the norms of humanity which in turn allows Israel to abstract itself in Gaza from the norms of the humanitarian law. So Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin, he knows about that. He has been trained into that. He's a muhabarat. Huh? That's uh, his culture. Lie, 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 and the bigger the lie, uh, the stronger it will remain. And you can lie one way, you can lie a second way, you can lie a third way. The, the most important thing is to lie and to cast the doubt. And one day you will accuse somebody of doing that, and the same day accuse him of, of doing something totally different and contradictory. But this is the key. So, 
to justify the full-fledged invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, and I remind you that uh, the Russian war against Ukraine didn't start two years ago, but started 10 years ago uh, with the occupation and annexation of Crimea and Donbass. So what did he do? He do well, Ukrainian resistance is just a bunch of Nazis. Nazis. You hear that today in Israel. Uh, Bezalel Smotrich says that you have two million Nazis in the West Bank. Two million Nazis. Netanyahu is speaking about Nazis on a daily basis. So this is what Net uh, Putin did trying to delegitimize the Ukrainian resistance, the Ukrainian uh, national movement, military and civilian, to resist the invasion. But the resistance led to a series of massacres. The most important one, the most famous one, but certainly not the only one is known under the generic term of Butcha massacres, but it was not only perpetrated in Butcha. Uh, it was uh, in uh, neighboring uh, towns and villages. And uh, when they were discovered, when the hundreds of corpses were discovered, when the, the, the testimony of tortured were uh, uh, given to the world, well, the Kremlin propaganda machine, smearing machine, say it's a well-orchestrated staging of Ukraine, a monstrous falsification. But in that case, nobody believes this big lie. Why? Because the international press was on the side. Because you had those so-called Western journalists who were there who can give credence, credibility to the testimonies of the victims. And they were soon followed by investigators tasked with documenting the crime for possible proceedings. Jonathan Little, who got the famous Goncourt Prize in uh, France, he was sent by Le Monde in 2012 in Homs. And he wrote a very revealing testimony, the Carnet de Homs, Homs Diaries. And he just published an incredible book in French called An Unconvenient Place. And it's between Babillard, the, the site of the 1941 massacre of uh, tens of thousands of Jews by the Nazis. And reflecting, he was in Butcha, interviewed the people. So now in Butcha, the people, they are fed with journalists because they say, we told our story so many times. And Jonathan Little speaks about that, writes about that in a very moving way, in a very literary way, in a very talented way. And I was thinking about the people in the Ruta, I was thinking in 2013, in Duma in 2018, people in Gaza now, and I was thinking, well, they would love to see Western journalists banging at their doors once, twice, three times, four times, and they wouldn't get tired of telling their story again and again and again. So today, if what is happening in Gaza is still happening under our very eyes, and despite the testimonies, and despite the pictures, and despite the horrendous videos that we receive, despite all that, despite this outrage, the key is that you don't have this international presence. The international presence of the press, but also the international presence of 
various bodies that would be tasked with investigating the crimes while you still have a crime stage, where you can literally gather the proofs of what is going on. So I've been in Gaza repeatedly. I wrote this Gaza history already uh, 12 years ago. And at that time, my conclusion in 2012, in 2012, was that Gaza was the key to war and peace in the Middle East. In 2012, not many people thought like me. In 2012, Many people, including in the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, believed that Gaza was a peripheral issue, a marginal issue, a problem, a burden, not the key to anything. Well, we see now that Gaza is the key. The key to endless war or the key to real peace that can be, of course, only based on the two-state solution with a democratic, demilitarized state of Palestine living side to side with Israel. But what we see is that from now on, and until today, until the very moment I'm speaking to you, Gaza is still besieged. Nobody has access to Gaza. The foreign press cannot get into Gaza. So the propaganda war is still raging. Uh, just one example. One week ago, Ramzi Abu Sahlul, 50-year-old something, waving a white flag in order to go and retrieve his skins in front of an Israeli position and killed on the spot. Of course, this was denied by the Israelis. By the moment ITV took the video, the moment it went on the Western media, then suddenly the issue became serious. And the French newspaper, Liberation, the Czech news unit, and they prove that despite all the Israeli denials, the guy, the guy posing no threat, waving a white flag, was killed bluntly from an Israeli position. Because, of course, the first reaction was to slander, slander, slander. No, 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 this didn't happen. The video is edited. Yes, you imagine people are there. You're, you're being shot at, you know. Of course, you have time to edit the videos. So, Liberation found the unedited video. They put it and they prove that it was assassination of an innocent civilian. So, this is what is happening, what is probably happening right now in Gaza. And Gaza, we have been repeatedly. The last time I've been to Gaza was nearly two years ago at the French Institute, because the French, they have the only uh, institutional presence in Gaza, foreign presence with this institute, which, by the way, was bombed by the Israelis without giving any explanation for why they bombed it. And so I met with the people at the institute. Uh, from all walks of life, from all generations. Well, because this is Gaza, the youngsters that come to the first floor, they didn't dare to, to come on the first floor, so I told them, no, no, come, 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 come. And we spoke, and I spoke to them about Ukraine. I said, Ukraine is important for you. This was March 2022. This was only one month after the Russian all-out invasion. And they said, yes, but we... Who is speaking about us? It has been 75 years and nobody is speaking about us. And I say, yes, but, you know, look, 
The whole world is aware that occupation, annexation, systematic bombing of civilian infrastructure means something. And it should also mean something to you. Of course, what debate, all this was in Arabic, the whole thing was called from Gaza to the world. Some of the people who attended this lecture are now dead and killed. They were innocent, they were civilians, they had all their life in front of them. Some of them were young, some of us were less young. And they were killed. They are just part of the 26,000 plus people killed, and it's probably much more when we will find the thousands of corpses and the rebels, when we will understand. And it will be a shock when the international press, meaning the Western press, will enter Gaza, because eventually it will enter Gaza. And then we will realize how those people were abandoned. How those people were abandoned during a 16-year-old siege. And how those people were abandoned like the Syrians during a decade of nightmare in front of such an horror. And um, I'm sorry to say, but it's like um, spontaneous empathy with a human being. As a human being has been lost at the start of the third millennium. And this is perhaps the darkest message from Gaza today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Ferdieu, for that uh, sobering, detailed, comparative account. Um, I, uh, I will open the floor for the questions. We'll take a batch of three uh, questions and comments. I have one of, uh, of my own very uh, quickly based on the, the, the final few statements, what is the end game? I mean, if this is, if this is a, uh, the, the intentional killing of civilians and then lying about it, the lying is, is undermined. So there's always the, the, the counter, um, the, the, the facts basically uh, come out. But then if you keep on doing this, well, Gaza has the capacity, if you count male over 18, so we're talking about in the range of 300,000 uh, in terms of young men who can carry arms. If you, uh, Stanley McChrystal has this famous uh, insurgence mass statement. Uh, that's the former commander of the US forces in Afghanistan. For every innocent civilian you kill, you engender 10 more fighters against you. Um, so uh, the, the ethical, moral, legal considerations aside, militarily speaking, that's not a strategy. Um, or this is a very, that's a strategy uh, that is not undermining the recruitment mobilization. So, and, and so w w what's the strategy? It, it reminds me of what uh, Lloyd Austin has said, you know, it, it, this can be an operational victory, but a strategic defeat for Israel. So keep that on, on hold. Any uh, questions or comments, reactions, please? Is there a mic? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. My name is Laurent Lambert. I'm a faculty at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. It was um, very interesting and uh, a pleasure to hear you on such unfortunately uh, sad topic. My question relates to a radical change in the perceptions in the West with regards to Israel and how this can constitute a key difference with the Russian case and the invasion of Ukraine. It seems that overwhelmingly Westerners have become more disappointed, more against the utter violence of the invasion of Gaza, the vast amount of death and this seems to be different from the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, which has been equally devastating and creating a lot of death, 
maybe not as numerous, but a lot of death and destruction. But the people who were in favor of Russia have largely stayed in favor of Russia. Well, in the case of the supporters of Israel, especially in the US, a lot of people are saying, I used to support the state of Israel, but I don't do it anymore. And we have a lot of organizations, including Jewish organizations in the West, which now take a, a stand against Israel or even against Zionism. And here, there seems to be a qualitative difference, which seems to me strategically important between these two cases. So my question is the following. Do you believe that this international change in the perception as to who's right and wrong in the conflict between Israel and Palestinians of Gaza, do you think it's an important factor that can change the evolution of the conflict, which, as you've reminded, has been ongoing for 75 years? Do you think here we have something different with the evolutions of the perceptions? Thank you. Thank you. Safe. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your lecture. I'm here on your uh, left. And uh, yeah, here. Uh, giving more attention to, uh, uh, to the journalism in the West, or the, the Western journalism. In the beginning of the war, we couldn't have uh, you know, believed in, the, in, the, uh, in the, the double standards of the, uh, of the Western journalism. And I, like, I couldn't believe that the, the genocide that you, you are seeing on live streams uh, could be converted into lies, uh, and uh, you know, in the in the in the, in the Western media, um, while while the the Palestinian narrative couldn't be believed in in any way, and for example, you you, you gave you gave a, a great example of the uh, of the Palestinian citizen who was shot uh, alive, and they the say that we have to. Uh, we have to investigate that this is this video is uh, is right or not. While on the on the other hand, if Israeli uh, media uh, the, um, the if they publish anything, even even um, an investigation about the UNRWA, which is not investigated yet, that the the, the the Palestinians who work on UNRWA they persevered on October the seventh or something like that, they are believed blindly without any investigation. Um, so th this this takes us to the, the the audience who won't believe on the Western media anymore, while they can see everything on live streams on on on, on other platforms too. So can you explain more the uh, the the future of the Western journalism or the Western platforms? One last, uh, Anas. Thank you very much for this lecture. My name is Anas Azraq, a journalist in Al Arabi Al Jadid. Uh, you have said in your book, Damascus Mirror, that the problem of international diplomacy, including the French diplomacy, is that it deals with Syria through uh, the uh, glorification of uh, Syria. Uh, does that apply to Russia by, uh, and uh, dealing with Putin and dealing with with Israel uh, and uh, Netanyahu, of course, uh, there is a difference uh, where uh, the uh, West deals with al-Assad uh, in, uh, in his uh, best interest and against uh, the Syrian people. And another question, if I may, you have uh, written about Syria. Uh, uh, Syria, a poem about Syria, which was turned into a song. Did you write about anything about Gaza uh, during this war? <laughs> Sorry. So the end game. Well, by definition, historians like me are very good at predicting the past. So I won't help you too much about the future. But what I know, and I wrote about that, I counted them, is that Israel waged since 1948 15 wars on Gaza. Israel won, quote unquote, militarily all those wars. And they lost it politically, all of them except one, the First Intifada. Because the First Intifada was concluded by the Oslo Accords, by Itzhak Rabin being prime minister, 
And considering that it was useless, endless, pointless to continue the repression in Gaza, and that Palestinians had to take over Gaza. So it would be, of course, the topic of another lecture to uh, debate about what it meant, because instead of delivering Gaza to a sovereign Palestinian entity, it only withdrew partially from the Gaza Strip. Uh, it was only Sharon, 12 years later, that withdrew totally to a Palestinian authority who is an authority only by name, because all his power are power who are uh, transferred from Israel to the Palestinian authorities. They are not sovereign powers. Uh, but what is sure is that apart from that, all those wars were won militarily and lost politically. In 2014, I wrote that it is uh, a moral outrage, but a strategic blunder to bet Israeli security on the total insecurity of Gaza, 2014. And I won't quote myself, uh, but I made several remarks of that sort until October 7. And I say after October 7, you can say, everything about all feelings are legit depression anger everything is legit except surprise <coughs> except surprise so if there is no political solution then israel would have lost again i don't I don't even speak about the Gaza population is now already the absolute loser. And you have to keep in mind that never in the very tragic history of the Palestinian people such a tragedy has been inflicted with so many deaths in absolute number, in proportion, with so many displaced, even during the Nakba. The Nakba is 750,000 people plus being uh, forced to leave their homes. Now it's nearly 2 million. And you saw the condition under which they live. Uh, uh, so this is absolutely unprecedented. But despite this unprecedented tragedy, if Israel doesn't deliver politically, it will be a political defeat. The issue is, of course, Netanyahu, because Netanyahu knows that the moment this war ends, he could go to jail. This is quite an incentive to go on with the war, because, as you said, this war could be endless, because there will always be Hamas fighters, there will always be militiamen in Gaza. So they can always say, oh, we still have to finish the job, we still have to. So that could be nothing by a pretext for very uh, petty personal calculation of Netanyahu trying to save his own political skin. He's obsessed, he's haunted. I, I wrote the only political biography of Netanyahu in French by Ehud Olmert going to jail and spending one year and a half in jail. Because for him, it would probably be more. So you have a prime minister who has this uh, constraints, and you have now an increasing number of people in his own cabinet, in his own party, who are openly talking about, quote, unquote, resettling Gaza and expelling the local population. So we are in front of a big uh, 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 there, there, should be a, there could be a big leap in the dark uh, before the end. So we'll see. But certainly, politically, it will be uh, lost 
uh, from this point of view. So, interestingly, the, the two questions are saying uh, the contra contradictory things. Uh, yes, interestingly, sorry, I just one that the, there is a big change in the opinion because of what we saw in Gaza. The other is saying that. Uh, the Western media are not showing uh, enough of what is happening in Gaza. Um, okay, okay. I think I, I spoke about that extensively. Yeah? So, um, the moment of truth, to speak of the truth, will be when Gaza will be open, and Gaza will be open. And what will even myself, who knows a little bit about Gaza, I know I will be horrified by what I see. And so people who are not prepared with this kind of reality, when they will physically be confronted to that, will be shocked in a way they cannot imagine right now. Because now it's abstract. It's screen. When they will be over there, when, we, when they will see the devastation, when they will smell the stench of the rotting corpses, when they will see all those thousands of years of civilization being systematically destroyed, the shock will be tremendous. It happened once in the history of Israel, and very quickly, and it had immediate consequences in Israel. I don't even speak about uh, Europe and the USA. It was the Sabra and Shatila massacres. When, so, Sabra and Shatila massacres by the Christian militias in uh, the suburb of Beirut that was occupied by the Israeli army uh, during three days from 16 to 18 of September 1982. And in the morning of the third day, Western reporters came in and the images shocked the world. But they shocked Israel. The largest popular demonstration in the history of Israel happened one week later against Begin, the then Prime Minister, Sharon, his Minister of Defense, with more than 400,000 people, which means approximately one Israeli out of 10 at that time. So you have to understand that for Israelis, Gaza is an abstraction and has been an abstraction for the past 17 years because no Israeli can enter Gaza except in a tank. If an Israeli citizen, if an Israeli reporter wants to enter Gaza, he will be jailed in Israel. Because Gaza, not Hamas, Gaza is a terrorist entity. It's quite unique. It's quite unique. A whole territory is a terrorist entity. So, the Israelis lost touch with Gaza. I'm speaking now just about the Israelis. They lost touch. They don't know what it means. When I research my book, every Gazan of, of my age, of course, had Israeli friends because in the 70s, in the 80s, beginning of the 90s, he was working in Israel. And he knew Shlomo, he knew Rafi in Tel Aviv, in, Ashkelon and places like that. Now it's over. Now it's over. It's over for the Palestinian population in Gaza, and it's over for the Israeli population. Hmm? So this will be quite a shock. Huh? And by definition, nobody knows what will be the aftershock of the shock. It could be quite, quite uh, crucial, deep. Huh? I don't know. The shock will also happen in the West when Western journalists, when you know your famous anchor, your Christian Amanpour, your this or that, will enter Gaza. And I think even war savvy Christian Amanpour will be just devastated by what she will discover. So we'll see. Huh? We'll see. And at that moment, will be really the uh, turning point, because until then, I doubt very much Israel will allow any independent journalist working freely in Gaza, any investigating committee working 
freely in Gaza. I doubt that very much. And this is an understatement. So thank you for your kind question. I wrote uh, Qasida about Gaza in 2012. That was sung by, uh, it was called uh, Hayam en Nakos, you know, Une vie de moins, one life less, but it's playing on word because it's a life of being less, not only one life less. So it was sung by a, a popular group from Toulouse called Zebda. Uh, again, it's a play on words in French that I will, won't even try to translate into English or Arabic because uh, Zebda is butter and beurre are supposed to be there. Anyway, so I did that. I did that. So I think Kassa Ed can be, uh, you know, fulfilling, but certainly <laughs> I can testify it doesn't change the course of tragic history, neither in Gaza nor in Damascus. Uh, about your question, well, of course, you know, and I've been for uh, nearly two decades a diplomat. Diplomats are supposed to deal with the state and regime they are uh, accredited to. That is the basis of diplomacy, bilateral diplomacy. Uh, so, uh, to go beyond that, you have, for example, the French Institute in Gaza that was operating with the civil society. You have all that. But of course now, nobody is even dreaming. Now the question is about survival, starvation, famine, epidemics. You know. So certainly, this is uh, the key to that. Um, you know, as a diplomat, uh, I, won't, I won't say which country. I was based in countries that when you had delegations that wanted to see human rights defenders, either there was a crisis with the local regime, or they will try to prevent it, or they will try to... Da, da, da. Okay. Well, a few years ago, I think it was 2017, the German foreign minister wanted to meet Israeli human rights defenders. Netanyahu said no. He went along, and Netanyahu canceled the meeting with him. I said, wow, Israel is becoming a Middle Eastern country. <laughs> they are adjusting to local standards, really. So, you know, this is, of course, at the key of trying to make uh, Diplomacy, diplomacy. You have their constraints. You have their uh, their rules. Diplomats should abide by diplomatic rules. But we should also always keep in mind that uh, you know one should never rely exclusively on the local government or regime, but should keep his eyes uh, open and his uh, Years uh, accessible to the civil society, speaking in general terms. Thank you very much. Um, I will. I have a couple of quick questions on so, from our social media um, followers, so I'll try to translate uh, very briefly. One is about the uh, a survey by the uh, the Arab Center that saw that a, a majority. Uh, saw that uh, the 7th of October attack were uh, legitimate and uh, and then how you take that and interpret that and there's like com some competitive dimensions mentioned here with the case of uh, the Algerian War of Independence. Um, the second one is on uh, actually uh, it's relevant but it's about Yemen and why is uh, th there's not enough attention press attention included uh, to the case of Yemen, which suffers from uh, also uh, multiple humanitarian tragedies. And uh, if there's a third, there's a third. Okay, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'll talk in Arabic if you don't want me. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Actually, I, my, I have a question here, some comments. But your last statement has really provoked me, really. 
you said that Israel become a military يعني بلد شرق أوسطي. I am I think when Josban he visited the area two decades and in Israel he said this is the only country democratic country and there was like you created the dictatorship in the West you supported them and then you you told us oh you are dictatorship who supported I mean Syria Rafat al Assad he was in France for for the kid and he is the killer of Syria. I mean, and you, you consider, still now, you consider Israel as a democratic. So Hitler, he, he came by election. Netanyahu, he also elected by Israeli people. So why you don't punish all Israeli? America invaded Iraq for false claims. And, sorry, Saddam, he invaded Kuwait. Saddam, he was dictator. He wasn't elected, though. Iraqi people paid for compensation for decades and decades. And now Israelis, uh, this elected, a democratic, the only democratic country, they are killing us, displaced us, and still became democratic. What? I mean, the population of Israel, oh, oh, they should be punished as, I mean, okay, the whole if, country. It's if, not only Netanyahu to go to the jail. If, Who elected Netanyahu? If there is a question, yeah. This is as a comment. This is a comment, okay. If there's and, a question or the if there's question, no question, no, I just was, I, I said that like, Netanyahu last said, if we did it, if the Lam Nantasir, Al Rahab say you had it, Europa. This is. Then terrorism what he, will threaten. What this? I mean, and where's the where's the terrorism? Okay. Actually? Okay. Thank, thank you. you thank much. you. Uh, so. Well, I think it's it's very interesting the the questions because uh, you know I told you I'm 62, happen to be an Arabist. I've been in this part of the world for 40 years. I tried each time to deliver something original, something special, something specific, and every time I have this kind of remark. <laughs> So I don't know what I should do to try and to move to the next level. OK, vent your frustration. Vent your frustration at me, since I happen to be a French citizen, and that, uh, as French, I should carry the historical burden of everything bad that happened in the Middle East, because I'm from the former colonial powers that supported those regimes and probably created them. You know. Vent your frustration. Vent your frustration, because everybody knows that in the Arab world there is no problem, there is no crisis, there is no oppression, there is no lies, there is no propaganda, there is no complicities with this kind of outside power. So, what can I do? You know, you could have told me that 20 years ago. If I come back in 20 years, you will tell me the same thing, no matter what had happened. Huh? But on one thing, I will be adamant in my reply. Collective punishment is absolutely unacceptable. And if you suggest collective punishment at the Israelis, it's totally unacceptable. Huh? So this is kind of reasoning that cannot be accepted. Okay? So when it comes to the popularity of the killers of 7 of October, well, again, I'm 62. I've always been fascinated by the, the the farther you are from the scene of the crime, the more the killer are popular. Because, you know, my friends in Gaza, my friends in Gaza, where I've been, and I know it's a privilege to have been repeatedly to Gaza, they were living and telling me that they were living a nightmare inside of the nightmare. The nightmare of Islamist domination inside the nightmare of Israeli blockade and attacks. Huh? So, of course, when you live far from Gaza, when you don't have to, when you don't know that the Qassam people are roaming at your door, when you don't know who could be picked in the night and eliminated in the morning, of course, you find them very, very cool, very. Okay. At the moment you're there, you know. There is a joke, a very sad joke in Gaza. They say the Hamas people, every time they fight Israel, why do they do that? Mm -hmm. 
Why do they do that? Because at the number of buildings they leave behind them. What they did on October 7 uh, includes despicable acts that will be a stain on the Palestinian movements for years and even decades. And in the meantime, they took shelter in the tunnels, and they are far more protected than the civilian population that they left unprotected in front of this devastation. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, safe, safe. Just uh, let, let the guests continue, and then we'll. Uh, Can I answer the, can, can, can I answer the questions or, or no? So, like the same, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, Yemen. So, the Yemeni conflict probably inflicted 300,000 deaths. Most of them not from the battles but from the epidemic, starvation, and all these that happened afterwards. At this moment, you have a ceasefire. And this ceasefire could turn into a permanent uh, settlement, which we all hope to uh, happen, because Yemen has suffered too long. And uh, the person was the question is uh, very uh, legitimate because Yemen was often forgotten. And uh, today people are speaking about the Yemen because of the Houthi, because what is happening in the Suez Canal. But the very uh, reality of what is happening to Yemen is forgotten. If I may connect that to my presentation and my <laughs> argument, well, it's practically impossible to cover the situation in Yemen from the ground. The Houthi, the Houthi as Yemeni, are Yemenis, just in case somebody will tell me that I don't know that the Houthis are Yemeni. Try and have a free media coverage in Houthi, El Daria, and call me back. No. It won't happen. It won't happen. So that's it. They control the information, they control the media, they have their own propaganda, OK. But it's not possible to have independent media coverage in Russia area. It's not possible to have it in other areas either. I don't uh, make distinction. But what is sure is when it comes to the independent access to media, well, in Yemen, all the factions agree on one thing we don't want. Uh, free journalism operating, and uh, Reporters Sans Frontières, uh, Journalists Without Borders, that I've mentioned, uh, regularly document acts of repression of journalists by the Russi, but by the other uh, uh, forces also, including the one recognized internationally, and I hope I answered the question. Okay, if there are no more questions, then I will have to thank Professor Jean-Pierre Filieu very much for his insights, and I will conclude this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.